Welcome everyone who is just joining um, now, uh, midday on the East Coast, morning on uh, the West Coast and evening across the Atlantic. Uh, so much for, for joining us today to discuss uh, this very timely topic of clean energy investing, both in the US and in Europe. Um, first, to set some ground rules. So given that this is a Zoom webinar format, you should know that uh, panelists cannot see or hear you as audience members and will only, uh, will only be the speakers on camera for the session. However, you can type uh, questions throughout the session in the chat box and we will respond to them. Uh, we'll hope to field your questions uh, during the discussion. We'll also have a 20 minute dedicated Q&A session um, at the end of the hour. So to get us uh, started, I'm very humbled to, to be able to introduce our three distinguished panelists as well um, as our moderator. So today moderating, we have Richard Kaufman. Um, Richard is the chair of Generate Capital, a leading financier and owner of clean economy infrastructure. He's also the chair of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority and an adjunct senior research scholar Columbia Center on Global Energy. He was in the, uh, in the office of New York Governor of Cuomo's as, as the state's first chairman of Energy and Finance for New York, or the Energy Czar. Um, on behalf of Governor Cuomo, Mr. Kaufman led New York State's comprehensive energy policy effort, known as Reforming the Energy Vision. He was appointed chair of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority uh, in 2013. As the state's most senior energy official, Mr. Kaufman was New York's lead delegate in Paris at the 2015 UN Climate Change Conference, or COP21. And in 2014, Mr. Kaufman was named by Fortune Magazine as one of the world's top 25 eco-innovators. As for our panelists, um, first we have Valerie Gardner joining us from San Francisco. So for much of the last decade, as a principal of TMN Investment Advisors, Valerie has been studying the impacts of carbon risks on economic activity and portfolio returns. Beginning in 2009, she began developing quantitative data-driven strategies for reducing carbon risks within investment portfolios. While many of her peers were engaged in ESG-focused explorations, Valerie's research led her to an entirely, in an entirely different direction, seeking to understand where the most scalable sources of abundant clean energy come from. This caused her to take a deep dive into the nuclear industry, where she discovered that most of the U.S.'s carbon-free energy is produced by nuclear power. TIA, TIA introduced its future generation portfolio in 2014, utilizing a unique methodology for constructing a post-carbon price portfolio for public market securities that effectively eliminates carbon risk without reducing market exposure within the overall energy sector allocation. In developing the future generation portfolio, what Valley learned about nuclear power and especially the advancements being developed now led to the launch of nucleation capital. Next, we have uh, Ashna Mira joining us from New Hampshire. So Ashna is a member of the investments team at New Energy Capital Partners, a private equity fund that invests in small and medium-sized uh, clean energy infrastructure projects and companies. In her role, she performs financial modeling, investment diligence, and market analysis to deploy capital from a 500 uh, million credit fund that will move the United States towards a low carbon economy. Prior to joining uh, New Energy Capital Partners in 2019, she was an investment analyst at Greenbacker Capital, a leading long-term owner and operator of sustainable infrastructure assets, and also interned at Barclays Capital in, an investment, in investment banking. She has also worked as a le legislative assistant to the former Union Power Minister of India. Ashna was named to the 2021 Forbes 30 Under 30 list for energy. And finally, uh, we have Stephanie Chrétien joining us from Paris. Stephanie has over 20 years of experience in digital innovation, venture capital, and startup support. At Demeter, a uh, uh, 1 billion euro AUM European private equity firm investing in the ecological transition, she's dedicated to the Paris Green Fund, investing in high growth SMEs for sustainable cities. Prior to, jo to joining Demeter in 2018, Stephanie worked with Roland Berger's digital practice to develop the ecosystem of digital partners. Terra Numerada at the international level. Terra Numerada now counts more than 100 partners and has uh, allowed Roland Berger to enrich its digital offerings. In 2014, Stephanie also created an independent consulting activity and supported four startups in their strategy, development, and fundraising. In 2011, Stephanie founded the corporate venture business for Eden Red, uh, driving 
15 million euros in investments in Partec uh, Venture Fund, another leading European uh, venture fund, making Eden Red the first corporate to invest in this fund. And they now count more than 30 corporates worldwide. She then led the investor relationship with Partec, as well as investments and a dozen uh, uh, operational partnerships with startups. So uh, this will surely be an interesting discussion with our, with our distinguished panelists. And with that, I'll uh, give the, the virtual uh, microphone to Richard to kick us off. All right, Adrian, thank you very much. And thank you all for participating. So it's about a week from exam time at Yale. So I can't help myself as an instructor that I'm going to start with some fill in the blank questions for our panelists that they don't know. So I'm gonna start with Ashna to you. Uh, the thing that I like most about clean energy investing is? The high growth, exciting and ever-changing nature of it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so Valerie, you can probably guess what's coming to you. The thing that I like least about clean energy investing is? Prejudice against certain types of energy. Clean energy is clean energy. We need all of it. So where there are preconceived notions that get in the way of doing good analysis and thinking about how do we solve these problems, I think the emotional side is the part I like least. Okay, so we're gonna come back and talk about nuclear because I think that's probably mm -hmm. what you're looking at. All right, Stephanie. Uh, Clean energy investing in Europe is? Is fast growing, really. There's a real momentum for clean energy now in Europe. Okay, well, that's, that's an excellent uh, lead in to the general question I wanna ask, which is, where are we now? What's the state of play? Uh, what's changed and or what is changing right now? And so, Stephanie, if you wanna keep going, please do. Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I, I think I just have to introduce Demeter. So uh, maybe uh, many of you do not know about Demeter. We are a, a pioneer uh, and European leader in uh, investing in the ecological transition. So we invest in all the sectors of uh, ecological transition, renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable agriculture, mobility, sustainable buildings, uh, circular economy, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Demeter was a pioneer 16 years ago, one of the first. Uh, we were just thinking about uh, clean tech and it was just the beginning. Uh, and now we are one of the European leaders with 1 billion euros under management. So um, what I mean is that there's a real momentum in Europe today, and, and you guys will tell me about the, the US, but in Europe, we feel a real uh, momentum as there's awareness at co consumers level, at companies level, at collective bodies level. Um, and there are also technology progress allowing uh, to have scalable and profitable solutions. And our own investors uh, are really um, uh, have appetite for clean energy and energy transition funds. So, uh, what I, what I feel is that there, there is a real momentum today. So that's what has really uh, changed. Anybody else want to add to that or disagree? I can, I can add to that a little bit. Um, so I think, you know, I haven't worked in the clean energy industry for too long, uh, but I've been following it for a number of years. And I think, um, you know, in terms of where we were, you know, say like maybe 10 years ago versus where we are now, um, I think, Obviously, this technological innovation and, and the pace of that has, you know, continued to pick up. But I think we're also starting to see innovation in terms of financial products, in terms of business models, um, as, you know, solar has kind of gained scale and wind has gained scale. Um, uh, 
in addition to that, I think putting renewables on the grid uh, has also created you know, some unique challenges, right? But challenges beget uh, solutions. And I think the markets are sort of starting to reward solutions uh, you know, to new challenges, uh, start reward like solutions to new challenges. So I think that's another very interesting trend. And of course, I think corporate um, you know, interest in renewable energy, I mean, I think uh, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, you know, just the amount of interest that you know, big tech and uh, you know, large companies seem to have uh, you know, in, in going renewable. And that, you know, it's, it's not just kind of the right thing to do, quote unquote, but also the profitable thing to do for them. Um, so I think those are all kind of like secular trends that you know, have emerged over the past few years and you know, something that we're paying a lot of attention to. Okay, so we're going to come back to this because when you both talked about uh, corporations, uh, we're going to talk about the impact of corporate demand, and then we can also talk maybe later about corporate investing activity and how helpful or not helpful that is. Um, so, Richard, let's can I just add add a point to this because I think both um, uh, statements were great, but I also want to say that I think in terms of how people are perceiving climate change in terms of the public's perception and concern about this issue. There's been a real sea change just since 2019, it seems during the run up to the US presidential elections, climate got a lot of attention. We had Greta Thunberg making her statements before the UN really seemed to galvanize the youth and the movements and the protests. So prior to that, it just felt like there really wasn't a huge amount of, it wasn't the top issue. Definitely in the 2016 elections, it was not the top issue. And I think it elevated to be one of the top issues in the 2020 elections. So there's really been a sea change. And I think Biden was elected with a very strong mandate to address climate. So I think here in the US, we have seen a really profound public expression of concern about this. So I think that's underlying a lot of this. Well, it was interesting. I do, uh, sorry, yeah. just, just, just one word. Yeah, I do agree about this. And that's why, why, what I was calling awareness, raising awareness at consumers level. Uh, it, and it also uh, brings a change in regulation. And I think this is a key element uh, driving uh, the, the, the scale up of, of clean tech. Yeah, yes. And then there, the, talk about the regulation climate, later. We're going to talk about policy in a, in a moment. Yeah. Uh, but just, you know, we've had, we had fires in California. We've had huge cold spells, you know, causing fatalities in Texas when the grid failed. Now we're also seeing the impacts of a changing climate. And I think people are really getting the message that this is not just a nice to have feature. This is actually critical and urgent. Well, you may have noticed even uh, at the president's speech that uh, even some Republicans stood up when he talked about uh, climate change. So that was interesting. Okay, so let's. So it seems to be consensus on that that uh, things have begun. Have really things have really accelerated. So let's 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 jump into. Uh, First, talking about sectors, uh, sectors that you're seeing for investing. Um, so, you know, there's obviously been a lot of investing in the past in solar, but I'd like to talk about uh, both technology sectors as well as sort of stage stage of development. Uh, a, a lot of a lot. I think the everybody remembers clean tech 1.0. So, I'd like you to. Who wants to start talking about uh, what what you see going on in the venture area, and whether you think that the venture area, the venture business model, is inconsistent with the capital intensity and the time duration of getting capital intensive businesses to scale? Somebody wants to take that question on. I'll jump in on that one. Um... So yes, I do think there's a little bit of inconsistency between the venture capital model and the innovation that is needed to address this. Um, 
from my and batteries and a lot of solutions don't have right now a way to go in and and transition a grid that is motivated to do so to 100% clean just today. It really is, we have bits and pieces, but they're incomplete and we're waiting in many ways for technology to catch up, for technology to, you know, pricing to come down. Um, venture capital can support a lot of the kinds of technology development and the kinds of business growth that we need, but it's not, it's not perfect because for most venture capital groups, they're raising money from LPs that are very conservative, from large institutions, from, from groups that are managing pensions, endowments, foundations, and they, they serve a little bit as gatekeepers for what they're willing to invest in. So in my mind, um, one of the really exciting trends is that there's been some disruption to the venture capital world. And there's new technology that is coming out that has allowed a broader, diverse set of GPs to launch funds um, using some disruptive technology to be able to bring a fund to a different class of investors that haven't actually previously been able to access that. So I think um, there are SPACs, which allow that, that have been allowing we're gonna, um, companies. We're gonna we're okay, gonna we'll get to those. But yes, right. I think venture capital is actually um, limited. It has some real benefits, but now disruptions are actually helping to seed a whole new generation and style of, of investment vehicles. So I'm excited about that. So Stephanie, I want to call on you. I mean, so because Europe has been a little ahead of the United States. So the, the flood of money that comes in, how's it being allocated between VC growth? Well, or yeah, I, I just read an interesting study from the CleanTech group and showing that uh, in Europe, um, CleanTech startups get 23% uh, of the worldwide funding. Um, so that's quite good. And when we look at growth capital, uh, clean tech growth companies, they only get 7% of worldwide funding. So in Europe, and I'm just talking for Europe, there's a real uh, gap in, in growth. So we need to go and get funds uh, to, to scale up startups because there's a lot of innovation in clean tech, but then we need to, to, to grow, to develop the companies more. Yeah, so by, yeah. by my math, that means that uh, that seventy percent of the capital, roughly, is going into project deployment, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Because you said 20, 20, 20, no, 23 20, in, in in startups, and tw and seven in growth. 20, yes. So that would imply that a big percent, which we which we would expect, a big percentage is going into into deployment. Well. I think that it's 7% of worldwide investment in clean tech growth is in Europe. Oh, okay, I see, I'm sorry. Okay, so it's okay. In, in that sense. So uh, meaning that uh, there is not enough uh, capital investments in growth in clean tech growth companies uh, in, in, uh, in Europe. Okay, I see. So we well, are financing a lot of startups. We have a lot of innovation, uh, but then we, uh, we have, uh, not enough capitals to um, uh, to to make them grow. Okay, good. So, uh, Ashna, do, what what's your perspective of in terms of where you see the funding going in yeah. terms of again VC growth capital or deployment of projects? Yeah, I think um, you know actually similar to what you mentioned, uh, you know, just a couple of minutes ago. I think I am seeing a lot go into project deployment. Um, I think you know um, at, at New Energy Capital, for instance, uh, you know we kind of call ourselves technology agnostic, but we don't take technology risk. Uh, so you know we're providing development capital to early stages of projects um, and to companies, you know, at, like to development platforms, you know, at the management, uh, you know, team level. Uh, but but you know we're not sort of set up to take. Uh, 
you know, development, like, sorry, um, technology risk. And so, you know, I, I think similar to what Stephanie is mentioning, right? I mean, I think you do kind of have this like value of death situation of, you know, a technology which is like very innovative and, um, you know, maybe has like a couple of, you know, pilot projects that it has done, but investors just haven't gotten comfortable enough with its ability to scale. And it's kind of a chicken and egg problem where, you know, you, you to, to be able to avoid that value of death, you need to sort of, you know, keep proving your hypotheses and, you know, getting those additional pilot projects and to get that scale. So, um, you know, definitely like seeing more, uh, you know, just a lot of, uh, you know, cheap capital, pension fund money, uh, you know, coming into kind of, you know, as we kind of call it straight down the fairway, boring, quote unquote, uh, you know, solar projects, uh, but, you know, less so in kind of that growth space, you know, where, where technologies are just starting to scale. Yeah, I mean, my perspective for what it's worth, I know I'm a moderator, so I should limit my interjection. <laughs> but uh, Stephanie, I, I would say that we have that same problem in the United States. I think yeah. that the, we have historically, historically have, uh, have had limitations in growth capital in clean investing. And I would put that in contrast to say the biotech space, which, you know, it takes about as long and as about as much capital as needed to develop a new uh, solar technology, for example. Uh, and that industry has had no difficulty in capital formation because I think probably historically is because while growth investors uh, are willing to take, uh, they're willing to take technology or market risk, but not both. And so in the case of biotech, I think investors recognize that if the drug works, there'll be a market. And I think the problem in the past, and I think maybe yeah. it's changing, yeah. is the perception is that that there might not be a market for clean tech because of stop and go of government policy or or that the costs were just simply too high. So that may have changed. So let's so I think Valerie, you opened the door to SPACs because certainly SPACs have been playing a, a role in public markets for growth equity. So you want to go out over your skis and say whether SPACs are a bubble or whether we're going to be, or really SPACs are going to play a, a, a sort of permanent role in helping to finance the Valley of Death? I actually think they're relatively permanent, but I think the quality is going to be more closely scrutinized. But there are a lot of vehicles now, syndications, of deals, I think is becoming much more common. I mean, I think SPACs for pools of capital to take a company public without um, as much um, of the gatekeeping is gonna be a, a key going forward part of the capital stack. And I think there are just a lot of, you know, kind of exciting innovations that can help technologies that have previously had a hard time getting to a liquidity stage. So I think all these things are good trends, but but I definitely believe that the investors who are looking at these deals need to not just say, oh, a SPAC, I wanna do that, but actually look at the yeah. fundamentals, look at what is that business? Is that a business that they really want to invest in? And is there a reason that that is going through with a, with a Pub, you know, being public in that way, um, and is there a benefit to that? Because I think there are pros and cons, and we want to make our own judgments. Hey, Steph Stephanie, they, they there have been have there there are some euro spacs that are some being of them, but uh, not back. that much, not that much for the moment. But some of them, I, I, I saw some in uh, in the charging station business, for example. Yep. So I'm just waiting to see this. Is not a, a bubble. So let's see what happens next. Okay. Um, Richard, I, yeah, I think it's uh, it's very much sort of a tone of caution that I personally take, uh, you know, to SPACs and kind of, you know, waiting to see what happens. Yeah. And I think the first question that, you know, anybody needs to ask, you know, when, when you're evaluating a company for the SPAC is why is it going public? I think Valerie mentioned it. You know, it's it's like you're, you're subject to so much extra scrutiny. Currently, you don't have any tax advantage treatment that oil and gas companies, like, you know, the way they get for MLPs and things. So why is this company even going public? Uh, particularly in an atmosphere where, you know, we're talking about this much capital being available in private markets. So I think that's when fundamentals become very, very important. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I'm, I think similar to the other panelists and to you, Richard, I think taking a very sort of cautious 
this wait and see approach, uh, you know, to, to see, uh, you know, where, which way this goes. So, Asha, before I want to go back to something you said before, because you talked about solutions, and I, I, I want to circle back to, uh, to the technology sectors and whether you see that investors are, are, are really focused on specific technologies, solar, wind, mm -hmm. hydrogen, I don't know, carbon capture, or whether you see increasing um, number of interest in sort of solutions type of companies where, where, uh, where uh, people are blending technologies or blending technology with software. Yeah, I think uh, more so the latter, I would argue. I mean, I think there's definitely sort of interest in like long duration storage, for instance, right? Like a company like Form Energy, for instance, um, is kind of on more on the technology side, as, as you would mention. But I think I'm seeing more and more kind of energy insurance products, virtual PPAs, um, you know, just, just software kind of demand response and, uh, you know, just management products, trading softwares. Um, so those are the kinds of companies that, you know, we are seeing kind of, um, you know, be very successful um, and, and, and in offering solutions to the market and sort of the unique challenges, as I mentioned, that renewables pose to the grid, uh, you know, due to the intermittency and things like that. So uh, definitely more so the latter, um, at least, you know, from, from the seat I'm in uh, at NEC. All right, Valerie, you want to talk about the nuclear? <laughs> um, sure. So... So nuclear is um, shifting. I guess I, let me give a little background for those who are not as familiar with nuclear. And I've kind of been coming at this from the point of view of originally as a um, public market um, investment management firm, we were looking at how do we get carbon out of our portfolios and we were looking at this right around 2010, 2011, sort of after the, the clean tech um, fiasco. And we were looking at how do we get carbon emissions out of our portfolio? What do we invest in? Because as indexers, we didn't want to simply be divesting. We are trying to replicate the the S&P. We're trying to have energy in our portfolios. But what do you invest in? So I actually did something that I think is not what most people do. And I looked at where we're getting our clean energy from. And in around 2010, two thirds of our clean energy was being generated by nuclear power. And, and this sort of hit me like a rock, like a shock. I, I didn't expect it. I have 50 solar panels on my roof. I'm like fully believing in the renewable world. But when you look at the data, when two thirds of the energy is coming from nuclear, I thought, okay, well, if I'm gonna create a carbon-free portfolio for clients, two thirds of it should probably be nuclear power and a third should be from renewables. And I spent some time looking at the nuclear industry. And the thing that I got struck with in this sort of long edu self education process was that the nuclear industry um, is all sort of based on the light water reactor, which is the very first design that became commercial. And turns out there were there was a bake off at one point way back when when the um, all the national labs were were rededicated to civilian energy, and they were asked to design um, ways to actually use fission to boil water, because literally that's sort of nuclear is a fancy way of generating steam heat to turn a turbine. And there were some fifty different designs that came out. And one of them was immediately picked up by Admiral Rick over of the Navy and was started, was deployed through um, the Navy into submarines. So that became the standard, the de facto standard for all nuclear was the light water reactor, really, really happy design that needs a lot of pressure and water cooling and was put into production. And there's a supply chain that was built up. And so then utilities began to adopt the light water reactor 
which literally requires that you replicate an underwater environment to cool your reactor on land. But it turns out that there are some other 50 designs or so that were optimized for use on land. And those have been closeted. Those were just not developed. Some of them actually had prototypes or betas built. But in today's sort of world, the light water reactor has been through three generations, actually three and a half. And the three generations were the light water reactor, which is the wrong reactor for terrestrial use with more safety systems. And then generation two is three, add more safety systems. So now you have a design that is larger, more expensive and takes 10 years to build. So, Valerie, so no, I just, I, I, just uh, I think you've made the point very clearly that you think that there's an opportunity for these next. Right. Okay, good. And, and so let me and wrap you up know and just the... say that there's more designs that are, have very different profiles that will be pretty exciting. And that's where the future, I think, of nuclear is. And you know that there's an increasing uh, sustainability regulation implemented in Europe uh, since March, and uh, what we call the taxonomy tries to define what is green and what is not green. And there's a real discussion about nuclear, yes. whether we can call it green or not. So, so Stephanie, uh, what are you seeing in terms of a technology focus? Well, we we'll, we we'll look at uh, all kind of technologies depending on on the development stage of our funds. So for our seed funds, we more look at uh, hydrogen, for example, um, and, and we look at uh, carbon, um, um, carbon, don't have capture, the word. Capture, question. yeah, capture. And for our infra, infra, um, infra teams, infra funds, uh, we look at uh, technology, but also uh, solutions. Uh, so not only technology and, and all kind, meaning, uh, solar, wind, uh, geothermal, uh, etc. So we are quite open. So I want to stay with you because I want to talk about uh, the EU Green Deal because I'm not sure that everybody in the U.S. is familiar. So maybe you could just just talk a little bit about what that policy could mean uh, if it's enacted in law. Well. Not sure I will be able to, to summarize the, the Green Deal uh, policy, but uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the objective is really to, to, to support um, uh, offer, offer and, and demand. Um, so uh, hopefully, uh, I think it's uh, more half of, of uh, the, the budget will be dedicated uh, to, uh, to supporting uh, green businesses. So um, the main challenge uh, will be to define uh, what are green uh, businesses. I mean, today uh, there's no standard in the definition. So there are some uh, trials uh, and I was talking about the, the taxonomy, um, but then uh, we, we, we have now for, for all investors, uh, there's a EU new regulation called uh, sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, um, where we have the um, uh, we are obliged to disclose all negative effects and 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 risk regarding sustainability for all our funds, and to classify our funds, uh, we call it Article Eight and Article Nine, uh, for uh, promoting environment and social characteristic, and also. Um, classifying funds who have the objective to reduce carbon emissions. So um, we are moving towards uh, green uh, and green businesses, but I think it's, it's only the beginning because it's, it's quite hard today uh, to classify and to measure the impact of all businesses. And this well, is so the next challenge for me. In addition, uh, companies, and so certainly multinational companies that want to do business in Europe, are going to have to establish uh, emissions reductions targets, scope one, scope two, and three. And that's, so that will- I think, I think we are going in the, in the right direction, but all the businesses that we support today, uh, they are not, uh, they do not have proper resources, competencies, et cetera, to, to do so. 
So, so we have, uh, as an investor, uh, uh, a big role to, to play, to, to, to support them. So thank you. So Ashna, um, so uh, what do you think, let, let's talk about the, the role of cor cor the corporate world. We talked about, uh, you know, corporate, uh, uh, well, first it started with renewable procurements. Now it's gone to uh, carbon emissions reduction pledges. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's presumably good in terms of demand. What do you see in terms of how much is corporate, how much do we see that there's greenwashing? How real is it, do you mm -hmm. think it is? What do you see in terms of corporate venture capital? Yeah, I think, um, so, so I'll, I'll kind of like segregate some of, you know, as you said, kind of the demand and the supply side of it, right? So um, on the, you know, on, on the demand side, I mean, I think big tech with sort of its big data centers, you know, that are using a lot of power um, have kind of, you know, said that they want to go green and honestly, in good faith are negotiating PPAs, VPPAs uh, with developers. Like some of the developers we work with, you know, some of the biggest clients happen to be, um, you know, sort of the, the, you know, the fan companies, right? Um, and so, so I won't, I won't say that's just greenwashing. That's sort of very real power, you know, electron and you know current being consumed that is coming you know directly from renewables and that's enabling the build of renewables on the grid right um so, so that's one side of it i think on the other side um you know i, I know stephanie's kind of talking about europe uh, you know what i have seen is that you just sort of see the european oil majors um so i'm talking about like shell total bp repsol be very very active um, in terms of, you know, wanting to shift into renewables um, and, and, you know, become actually big project owners, like they're coming in, you know, signing hedges, uh, you know, trying to own projects, try to buy projects, even in North America, in addition to doing this in Europe, whereas in like US oil companies, you know, it, it, it's kind of like they're almost kind of dancing around it in some ways. Uh, that's, you know, that's my personal opinion, where there is a lot of, um, you know, talk about, oh, you know, I, I want to make our technology, uh, you know, more efficient. Um, uh, I'm going to capture the carbon, I'm going to, you know, sort of do do all of these XYZ things without kind of making that commitment, oh, that we're going to go renewable. So again, I, I wouldn't use as strong a word as greenwashing. I think there's definitely sort of good intent there, uh, you know, to move in that direction. But I think there is this sort of, um, you know, desire to also kind of have natural gas be a big part of, uh, you know, of the energy mix in the US. Um, and so, you know, kind of almost going back a couple of minutes as to, you know, what qualifies as green versus not. Um, I think there's definitely kind of an all of the above uh, approach in the US. Very Whereas I think in Europe, and, and Stephanie, please do correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is kind of a clearer demarcation, um, you know, in terms of what they see as green versus not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, total communicate on, on, on green energy now. Uh, yeah. But don't you think the, the US uh, oil companies will, will come to it? I mean, they, this is the, the direction today. No? Yeah, I think but they're taking a more incremental approach, you know, as opposed to kind of this more disruptive approach of, you know, oh, we're, you know, by this year, we're going to go renewables. I think, I think, you know, they're, they're taking a more like even through the corporate VC arms and things like that. Um, you know, I'm not seeing them kind of come in like Total did, you know, with SunPower, for instance, or, you know, um, in, in sort of the same kind of big gung ho putting lots of billions of dollars, you know, behind it. Um, and, and so, yes, absolutely, you know, as I said, the intent is there, and I think they incrementally want to move in that direction, um, because I think they're seeing the writing on the wall, you know, as, as everyone in the world is, but I think, you know, they're more cautious in their approach in terms of, you know, the path to get there. So we're, we're running out of uh, time here for this part of the discussion. I want to open it up in a couple of minutes to, uh, to questions from, from uh, our, our participants. So I, I have... Uh, one general question, which you would, which you could all answer as quickly as you can, and then I have some closing questions. So uh, let's talk about the flood of money from ESG, and how much do you think that that's going to change the mainstream, and how much is it going to wind up in dedicated funds? Who wants to take that? I, I can begin because uh, I mean well, well you call it, we can call it ESG or impact uh, I don't know we we only have dedicated impact uh, ESG funds uh, and we see that there's an increasing uh, demand from investors to to invest in such uh, such funds uh, we are launching now uh, three uh, three new funds on uh, climate infrastructure on uh, green European tech. Uh, 
uh, Franco German Fund and the VTREF at Sustainable Viticulture uh, Fund. So interesting for wine. Um, but uh, I think that our investors are um, demanding for uh, steering the funds. So um, they, they want to invest uh, in uh, impact uh, funds and, and companies. That's a real demand. And they also want to, um, to be sure that their money is well invested. So there's a, a real challenge, as I was saying, on measuring the impact. I think that's key if we want to, to develop uh, dedicated uh, funds uh, to be able to measure the impact and there's no standard today. So we are trying to innovate and, 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 and propose new methodologies um, but uh, I really think that it's a, a, a good way to, to scale up impact to have dedicated uh, funds. Okay, good. So now we're going to do, we're going to wrap up here with one more fill in the answer <laughs> sentence. And uh, Stephanie, since you were last, you're going to be first. Okay. One thing that I know now about investing in clean energy that I wish I knew when I started was... Um, one thing I need, or I don't know. Um, but it's not uh, going as fast as uh, I was expecting. Okay, that's good. All right, Ashna, the biggest mistake that I've made in investing in clean energy is i think assuming that you know if, if renewable energy as an industry exists in a silo it's it's at the end of the day of you know a part of the entire sort of power generation electricity generation ecosystem and you can't just sort of say oh put renewables in the grid <laughs> you know without without thinking about sort of the all the consequences and kind of what that means you know for, for the broader grid um and and so just kind of assuming that it was kind of its own industry, which it absolutely isn't. You know, it requires so much understanding and appreciation for everything, you know, that's related to it. Good. All right, Valerie, five years from now, we will be talking about... Hmm, I think we'll be talking about a much smarter, much more powerful and much more functional grid that changes the paradigm of how we are uh, not just generator energy and utilization to route the power, whether it's electrons or it's high temperature steam to, to specific purposes. You know, the, you need district heating, you need industrial process steam. I think nuclear on the grid will help change the the way we think of the grid as a, a distributor of power in different forms and in, at different times. So we're not managing from a scarcity point of view, but more from an abundance point of view. Very good. All right, thank you. Adrian, over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Richard, um, for, for that entertaining animation. So we have quite a few uh, questions in the chat box, and I also wanna leave a few minutes for people to Jumping live. This first question is uh, aimed towards Stephanie, uh, European growth funding in clean energy. We've talked about how Europe is often a leader in sustainable policy, but to get at this why, why do you think there's such a gap, uh, particularly in growth equity funding in clean energy in Europe? Well, um, I think it, it, it comes from, from the fact that there's no, uh, you know, large market large large homogeneous uh, market in Europe as there is uh, in the US. So uh, um, fast growing startups tend to go to, to the large market and, and tend to go to, to the US or, or, or to Asia. I think it's, it's uh, easier. And also because uh, there's a lack of uh, exits, uh, of big exits, at uh, corporates and, and, and with IPOs in, in Europe. And I think we really have to, to educate more of the market and, and take examples from, from the US on, on this part to be able to, to build um, a, a real uh, growth investing in, in clean tech. Great, thank you. 
Um, this next question gets back to our discussion on SPACs and anyone can field it, um, in particular about the risk component of SPACs. So do private alternative investment vehicles like SPACs really modify the overall risk of these investments or are they just reallocating risks? That's to say, are we just shifting risk from LPs like in VC to a more distributed investor base um, as is the case with SPACs? Anyone can, can, can jump in on this. I agree. I think that that's true. I think it's a way to achieve liquidity um, and shift sort of the profile of the venture, and and to give it, you know, perhaps more more capital access to capital. But it's it is shifting the risk, just not changing the risk. Yeah, just to add to that a little bit, though, I think at some level, I think being public and kind of being, you know, sort of correlated to, you know, broader movement of the, you know, of the clean energy industry. Um, and obviously sort of just public sentiment about clean energy, right? I mean, I think we saw that with yield calls from 2013 to 15, right? Um, so I think there is a little component of risk that also increases, although I agree with Valerie, um, you know, that it's mostly reallocation and redistribution of risk, but, uh, you know, you do sort of get that additional, you know, just being public risk. Um, well, if I can jump, 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 jump in this, the, there's an issue though of diversification, right? So the, the benefit, the argument in, in favor of SPACs uh, is that, uh, that because the investor base is broader, uh, then, then those investors can diversify their risk, which is a benefit to the investor. Yeah. And so from a company standpoint, um, it means that, um, I, you know, I guess access to capital might be improved both by being public and by virtue of having a broader group of investors. And I'd like to add something else, which is that there's an inherent sort of discrimination in the investment world against young people. The reason being that young people typically are not accredited investors and so much of venture and innovation is funded through vehicles for which in order to participate, you must be an accredited investor. So a spec that can take an, an innovative, exciting technology public can then allow younger investors who really support that technology or that approach to invest in it. Whereas, for uh, a fund like mine, investing in advanced nuclear, you have to be an accredited investor and that restricts it to people who have made more money and therefore typically are older. A bit more of a democratization thing that is achieved with a SPAC. Great, thank you. Um, this next question concerns solar. So uh, what are the parameters you look for when solar, ne when solar needs to accept a new model in the market? That's to say, how do you validate the performance? Um, but what type of data is needed to require, uh, is, yeah, what type of data is needed to scale up solar? I'm not taking no. that one. Okay, we can, if no one has a strong opinion, we can, we can certainly take another one. No, uh, I, um, I'm not sure I will be able to, to answer the question, but we, we, uh, we invest, well, for, for my fund, that's Paris Green Fund, we invest in SMEs for sustainable cities, uh, and we have invested in uh, solar uh, self-consumption solutions. So it will not be development of uh, solar projects, I will not uh, be able to, to tell you about the right KPIs, um, but uh, just, yeah, important to know that we also look at um, uh, solar efficiency, you know, optimization of uh, production and consumption of, uh, of solar uh, energy. So this is uh, really important for us. Great, thank you. Um, another question concerning the EU, but this is uh, open to, to all of you. And it's not about in, um, investing in particular, but just a general regulatory concern. So do you all predict that the carbon footprint of manufactured products will become a consideration when importing goods into the EU. So essentially integrating the, the carbon footprint um, 
when considering sure it, it it will i i mean i mean this is this is where we are going but still there's a question about the taxing the uh, the carbon so uh, uh, carbon taxation and there, there's a new idea today about uh, if it's not possible to tax uh, carbon uh, high, high carbon uh, products and, and companies maybe we could detax the green product and I think it, it's a, a very good idea uh, to go in that way and and, and we see a lot of companies uh, wanting wanting now to calculate the carbon footprint. And it's uh, integrated in a lot of um, requests for proposal today to, well, mainly in, in Europe, uh, most of, you know, large corporates uh, requests for proposal include carbon footprint today. So uh, there's a real need for companies to be able to calculate them. And then uh, we will have to, to adapt, I think the taxation and, and detax uh, I think for green products is really a good solution. Great, thank you. Also, this is a 10 minute uh, warning mark to any participants who still want to send in questions. Now is the time. Um, uh, one that just came in. So the idea of a super grid has been around for a long time and seems to be creeping up again. Is it a realistic idea uh, for a super grid to be built in the US or Europe, but, but so, super grid, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm not as sure I've heard super grid either. So is there? No. A, <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I mean, I do the think the grid is the largest device built by humanity. We, we, I mean, energy is so ubiquitous, so necessary, so vital. It's almost more important than water. With the proper power, you can almost generate water. So I think the grid is one of our most, it's first of all, it's our largest device and it's one of our most important devices. And it's increasingly important as we think about this decarbonization challenge because so much of the liquid fuels that are used to power transportation and industry and, and heating is going to be migrating to the grid. So if I don't know what, what the definition of super grid is, but if we don't have a super grid in the future, we're gonna probably be in trouble because some of the projections for how much power the grid is going to have to hold when you think about not just decarbonizing the fossil fuels that are currently on the grid, but then the fossil fuels that are not grid based, like for cars and for trains and for buses and um, industrial power and um, all the other uses. And then you add more demand to the grid, like from cryptocurrencies and from all the video conferences and everything else that's going digital. Um, I think the grid is gonna have to handle multiples of what we currently have on the grid. It could be two, two times, three times, four times. It is not clear, but it's definitely going to have more burden and need to be stronger and more reliable. And like have things like routers and stuff that can direct the power where you need it at that time. If you've got enough power over here, maybe the power should be going there and figuring out how to integrate distributed grids because there'll be a bunch of sort of little grid nodules or something that people will be off grid and on grid at various times. So we definitely need more work, more innovation, more development and more reliability and backup on this grid. Yeah. And I think just to add to that, um, you know, in terms of, you know, how I'm interpreting the super grid is kind of increased transmission infrastructure. So absolutely. I think going off of what Valerie said, we absolutely need increased transmission infrastructure. I think in the US in particular, I think we need the ISOs talking to each other. I think the Western sort of energy imbalance market that is coming up, 
um, it's sort of like an example of that, right? It's like various utilities and ISOs trying to kind of talk to each other, quote unquote. Um, uh, and, and then in, in addition to transmission infrastructure though, it's very important to know that just having a national grid is not gonna solve all your problems. So what you ha saw happen in ERCOT, you know, the, the answer was not to just have it be connected to sort of all, you know, the, the neighboring ISOs because they were experiencing sort of inclement weather and kind of, you know, peak in demands, uh, you know, surge in demands during those periods as well. And so, you know, we have to talk about sort of power market and wholesale power market structures and talk about capacity and how to develop resilience and reliability uh, while still offering affordable power and you know how that has to include sort of solar and wind but also kind of you know your baseload resources um, you know for firm powers right so so I think again like when when we kind of talk about quote unquote a super grid just connecting everything to each other is, is not the only solution it's, it's part of the solution. Great thank you. Um... In our last five minutes, I'll probably field about two more questions. So uh, this question addresses hydrogen power, which we haven't discussed yet. Um, what are your opinions on the different colors of hydrogen? Is it greenwashing or does it actually have a value outside of marketing? So I think hydrogen is going to be an increasingly important part of the energy system. It's not really an energy source as, as much as it is a store of energy. And I really recommend that if anybody is really interested in learning more about hydrogen, they, they read the Lucid Capital, Lucid Catalyst, excuse me, uh, report on hydrogen. It's really comprehensive and thorough and can give you a really good sense of um, what the potential is for the hydrogen market as an alternative way to power some some of the uh, embedded equipment and motors and and um, engines that we have that need liquid fuels while we're transitioning to full you know 100% carbon free. Great, um, and just a follow up to that, uh, Valerie, you can take this uh, on the subject of hydrogen. Are there any incentives for hydrogen to scale up and what percent of energy do you think will be generated from hydrogen in the next five to 10 years? Um, so I don't know if there are incentives to scale up other than what we currently have. You know, with respect to how we're decarbonizing the economies, we do have, to really think about how we're going to incentivize deep decarbonization on many levels. And I'd say there's not enough right now. We need more uh, incentives, more um, demand for CO2, demand for carbon and uses. Um, hydrogen is, you know, has already some existing markets and it is potentially capable of scaling up significantly in a way to be able to, um, have a major role in the decarbonization thing, but we need to be valuing carbon. I mean, we, we have problems in the market. We don't value grid reliability and we don't value the pollution and the emissions of, of our dirty types of energy. So we need to get these things solved. We need to figure out how to solve some of these market imbalances in order for these technologies to really have a much stronger sort of economic base upon which to grow. Great, thank you. And then uh, just our last two, three minutes, I have one last question that I'm actually gonna throw back to our dear moderator, Richard, directed that towards him. Um, is offshore wind the right solution for the Northeast? What headwinds or tailwinds exist to the build out? Well, I think it's um, in order to achieve our climate objectives, we're going to need, we're going to need everything uh, in the Northeast. So we're going to need offshore wind and onshore wind and, and solar. Um, so, I mean, offshore wind is a tremendous resource off the Northeast. Uh, the wind resource is good and the, uh, the, the continental shelf extends far enough offshore so that the view shed is not impacted, um, but you can still put the, put the uh, foundations in so they don't have to float. And so the other benefit that, that exists with offshore wind is that it's close to population centers. So the kind of tr transmission issues that, 
that exist in trying to bring a lot of renewables from remote places in the Northeast uh, doesn't exist. So I think that there are, uh, there, there, under the Trump administration, there were some headwinds, but I don't see, I don't see many headwinds at all. I mean, I think the uh, industry has, has generally done a good job in terms of, of getting support of local communities uh, and working with, uh, with, 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 with uh, environmental groups and fishermen. So I'm very, I mean, we're gonna see a very, very, very large industry develop uh, in, in offshore wind in the Northeast. And it's going to also bring economic development as well as, as a lot of uh, real scale in renewables. Well, thank you. And with that, we're at the hour. So just to be cognizant of everyone's time, I want to extend a sincere thank you to our three panelists and moderator. We have panel, we have uh, researchers, practitioners, and students in the audience. So thank you so much for your insightful um, comments about this, this essential topic now and going forward, particularly with the new administration in the US as well as the new governments um, worldwide. So thank you so much for your time again, and we wish everyone in your different time zones um, uh, a great weekend uh, and, and uh, to stay, stay in touch with the ICF at Yale. Um, events like these happen uh, periodically. So thank you so much for, for joining this one and stay tuned for future events. Thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good weekend. Bye.